Okay, why don't we get going? Um, we've got a full agenda today and it's, it's really great to be here. Um, welcome to the Community Foundation of Mississauga's 2021 Vital Signs launch. My name is Helen Seibel and I am Vice Chair of the Board here at the Foundation and I also chair the Community Leadership Committee which is responsible for producing our Vital Signs report. I will be your host for today's launch. I would like to begin by acknowledging and honoring that the land on which we operate is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. For thousands of years, Indigenous peoples inhabited and cared for this land and continue to do so today. We acknowledge the territory of the Anishinaabe, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples, the land that is home to the Métis, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who are direct descendants of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Here at the Community Foundation of Mississauga, we are committed to continue our journey towards truth and reconciliation. We'd like to start today's uh, meeting with a greeting from Councillor Ron Starr. Ron is a 40-year resident of Mississauga an 11-year City of Mississauga Council member, and he has been an active committee and board member for more than 30 years. Unfortunately, Ron is unable to be with us today in person, but he has graciously sent his greeting via video. So I'd like to welcome Councillor Ron Starr. It is my pleasure to congratulate the Community Foundation of Mississauga for an extraordinary year of giving and the launch of your fifth Vital Signs Report. Established in 2006, the Community Foundation has provided leadership and understanding of the significant growth of the City of Mississauga and its needs. During this time, the Foundation has granted over $20 million to charities in Mississauga, with over $3 million in supporting the emergency needs throughout the pandemic period. Keep up the good work, Community Foundation. We are doing a great job. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, we would also like to thank our uh, Novo Nordisk, who is our title sponsor for Vital Signs. Their generous funding and support has helped us bring this project to life. I am very happy to introduce Adam Marcella, Director of External Affairs with Novo Nordisk, who would like to say a few words. Thank you, Helen, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Novo Nordisk is proud to be the title sponsor for the Community Foundation of Mississauga's 2021 Vital Signs uh, Report, especially in the context of a global pandemic and the significant impact this has had on our community here in Mississauga. Just wanted to check in and see if um, Adam is frozen for any of the other participants, if it's just me. Pauline? Yeah, he's frozen. Okay. Okay, so why don't we do this? It's, we, let's, let's move forward and if Adam Joy is able to get his connection. Uh, there we go. Hi, Adam. Are you back? <laughs> That Maybe. cut out at the most awkward moment, but I'll, I'll try no. to keep going. Maybe I don't know no where problem, that please. Why don't well, Adam, why don't you start from the beginning? Because I think you got cut off very early on. So please go ahead. It's no problem. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we're proud to be the title sponsor here today of the Vital Signs Report, especially in the context of a global pandemic and the impact that this has had on the community in Mississauga. Our purpose as a company is to drive change to defeat diabetes and other serious chronic diseases, and our Canadian headquarters is proudly located right here in Mississauga. Diabetes or prediabetes affects one in three Canadians. As part of Peel Region, Mississauga is no stranger to diabetes. In fact, uh, the rates of type 2 diabetes in Mississauga are higher than the provincial average. In Peel Region, one in 10 adults lives with type 2 diabetes, and when broken down by age, one in six adults between the ages of 45 and 64 in Peel lives with diabetes. That number jumps to one in three after the age of 65. Um, in addition, uh, over 50% of adults in Peel region identify as Asian, South Asian, Arab, Black, Hispanic, or Indigenous, which represent groups that are at increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes over the course of their lives. Disease prevention in the communities where we live and work needs to be at the forefront of our efforts to defeat diabetes and other serious chronic diseases. 
And that's why earlier this year, we proudly announced that we're continuing our 100 year partnership with the University of Toronto to improve the lives of people living with or at risk of developing type two diabetes and obesity. And we did that by launching the Novo Nordisk Network for Healthy Populations based at the University of Toronto Mississauga campus. This longstanding partnership builds on a shared commitment to defeating diabetes and is an example of how public and private organizations can collaborate to achieve improved public health. We also recognize the prevalence of diabetes and obesity in the city of Mississauga when we launched our first ever Novo Nordisk Diabetes and Obesity Fund uh, uh, and the Healthy Mississauga Micro Grant Program. Community and grassroots organizations were invited to propose their initiatives aimed at tackling obesity and preventing type 2 diabetes among vulnerable populations in the Mississauga area. Six organizations were awarded grants of up to $15,000 each enabled and administered by the Community Foundation of Mississauga in support of their innovative and community-based interventions. We look forward to continuing this granting program in 2022. Later this month, we also look forward to officially launching our Cities Changing Diabetes program in Mississauga. Next week, on November the 10th, Mayor Bonnie Crombie and the entire Mississauga City Council will be signing the Urban Diabetes Declaration which signals the city will officially be joining the city's changing diabetes program and be added to the map of global partners and cities. The city will be starting on a multi-year journey focused on type 2 diabetes prevention and reduction through community-based interventions involving, involving a wide range of partners. We have seen in the 39 other participating cities around the world how this approach can have a sustainable and lasting impact on urban communities and public health. Mississauga joins as the 40th city in this global network and through community consultation will conduct primary research, examine city policy and explore community level interventions to improve the health of Canada's sixth largest city. On behalf of Novo Nordisk Canada, we're proud to support the development of the 2021 Vital Signs Report, which highlights the state of one of Canada's largest and busy, busiest cities. Thank you for your patience. Apologies for the technical glitch. And uh, Helen, back to you. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, thank you for telling us uh, about the work that you're doing to address uh, high rates of diabetes here in Mississauga and around the world. It's really remarkable. Um, so we're going to move forward to the next part of our program. Today is really an exciting day for us here at the Community Foundation. This morning, we published our fifth Vital Signs Report, and it is by far one of our most compelling. We chose to focus our report this year on the impact that COVID has had uh, on Mississauga. Peel Region, where we are based, faced high infection rates and had some of the longest lockdowns and school closures in all of Canada, if not the world. This had a huge impact on our community, as you will all know, for the people who live here and the many organizations that serve them. We know the need was huge because our own grant making last year almost tripled with the addition of COVID relief funding. Our report looks at COVID across a variety of indicators, and I'll highlight just a few of the findings here to whet your appetite, but will encourage you to take a look at the report when we're done. Food security was a massive issue for many, many across Canada, and Mississauga was no exception. Many turned to food banks for support, and the Mississauga Food Bank in particular saw a 64% increase in new clients in the first three and a half months of the pandemic compared to three and a half months prior. On the environment sign, side, as lockdown continued, our citizens sought refuge in outdoor spaces. Overall, our parks had a large increase in usage throughout the pandemic due to restrictions on indoor events and the push towards outdoor activities. For one example, uh, the Riverwood Conservancy had a 129% increase in usage on one of their trails alone. The third area we, we thought we would highlight is housing. So the pandemic has definitely influenced housing by exacerbating supply and demand. Although low interest rate pressures led some towards purchasing a new home, that remains an impossible dream for many people in Mississauga. Housing costs here continue to rise and by our calculations, only about 46% of Mississaugan households will be able to afford a typical home. 
So these are just some of the findings that we outlined in our report, and there are many more. And I would encourage you to explore it um, at, over the rest of the day and after you leave the webinar. So now it's my great pleasure to welcome our two speakers. Um, Dr. Lowe, um, who has uh, had to step away briefly because he is responding to a motion in council. He will be right back. Um, Dr. Lowe is currently the Medical Officer of Health for the Region of Peel uh, Public Health. And I'm sure that over the past two years, you've heard Dr. Lowe on many occasions speaking about different public health guidelines around COVID, addressing the concerns of citizens and working with many different organizations to keep our city and our region healthy and safe. It's a great pleasure to have him here today. Our next speaker is Gurpreet Malotra, who's Chief Executive Officer of Indus Community Services, a nonprofit organization that's been providing person-centered, anti-oppressive programs and services to people in Peel Region for more than 35 years. Like Dr. Lowe, Gurpreet has been on the front lines of COVID, addressing issues that affect the, affect the constituents he serves through Indus and speaking up for some of the more vulnerable segments of our community. It is a great honor for us to have both of you here today to share your perspectives and experiences over the last 18 months to two years. So I believe that Dr. Lowe is still responding to a motion that's been raised in council. So I'm going to turn my first question to you, Gurpreet, and then we may focus on you for a few questions until Dr. Lowe is uh, able to return. Um, so Gurpreet, I'd like to talk about the impact the pandemic has had on the labor market here in Mississauga. Increased unemployment has really amplified inequalities and widened the gap between rich and poor. And even in the best of circumstances, individuals living with a low income struggle to afford all of their basic necessities. With your experience in the employment sector, can you speak to which sectors were hit hardest and why? It, it, thank you, Helen. That, that's a, a, a really important question and, it, and it's a genuine pleasure to be here uh, at the launch of the Vital Science Report. Um, as we can all see in, in this year's comprehensive Vital Science Report, the, the pandemic hit all of us very hard and created major disruptions uh, all around the world. And of course, we felt that here in Mississauga. Our most impacted industries were food, accommodation, arts, culture, and recreation. They appear to be the most economically impacted by the pandemic. These areas experienced some of the longest and most restrictive lockdown measures um, with so much less business and pleasure uh, uh, travel. Job losses were greatest in the accommodation and, and food services sector, uh, at close to 40% reduction from the norm. And in a survey that the Peel Halton employers conducted in September and October of 2020, arts, entertainment, and recreation businesses uh, were most likely to say they reduced their workforce in response to COVID-19. And very worryingly, were the most likely to be concerned about their ability to even survive. Imagine life for you and I in Mississauga without a vibrant arts, entertainment, and recreation sector. In addition, the manufacturing logistics sector uh, must also be emphasized. We saw huge pressures on essential workers, selling and packaging goods and transporting them across the country. These really hardworking Mississaugans were, were the central hub of activity for the country, while themselves often being precariously employed. Uh, I remember an interview where, where I pointed out that our city is not only home to the nation's, nation's largest airport, but that we probably also had the, the largest number of Santa's elves working hard during last year's holiday shopping season. Unfortunately, there wasn't any festive magic involved. It was the dedication of, of employees who had little choice if they wanted their families to get by. The lack of paid sick days, the immense pressure to move product, meant that manufacturing and logistics sectors weathered a very difficult storm. We had family breadwinners, and this was before the vaccine, who drove delivery vehicles, stacked shelves, cashiered out our purchases. This, this uh, was a direct increase uh, as a risk to their health, um, but it also put more pressure on their mental well-being. Uh, and, and, and ultimately contributed to uh, an increased number of COVID cases amongst those people who did those jobs. And sometimes because of the way that the job was structured, they often had perhaps two jobs in two locations. So if one fell sick, 
they, they, they would be a transmission point in, in two work sites and of course the home and community. And, and, and add to that the fact that uh, they may not have even had time to go get tested or were afraid that if they get te got tested and had a, a positive result, that they would lose their job and then where would their family be? So all of these pressures uh, put a, a, a major impact on, on, on these important economic sectors and, and, and had a significant impact on, on, on uh, the employees that, that call Mississauga home. Yeah, thank you. I, I think it's so interesting to get your perspective and know, you know, to have some of those really tangible examples about working multiple jobs and how that impacts transmission and to remember that the nature of precarious work is very evident among the communities here in Mississauga. We have great diversity, but also moving from, you know, one neighborhood to another, you see enormous changes in the socioeconomic makeup of those pop of those particular neighborhoods and, and the bearing that has on how the pandemic imp impacted us. So thank you. I think I'm going to keep, we're going to keep the conversation between you and me, Gurpreet, so hopefully that's okay. I hope everyone else is okay with that too. Um, the the next question I, I, I have for you um, is actually continues um, this idea of sort of, I guess, the, the mental well-being and the, the feeling of belonging and inclusion. So, you know, we know that a person's connection to their community is really influenced by how much they feel they belong to that community. And belonging is one of our vital signs indicate, indicators. It, it speaks to social cohesion. In 2019, uh, the Peel Region Social Capital Study found that 76% of residents 18 and over here in, uh, in Peel Region reported a very strong or somewhat strong sense of belonging to their local community. In your opinion, how has the pandemic affected this statistic or, or how is this relevant within the pandemic? Well, I'm very pleased that the, both the region of Peel and Mississauga Vital Signs had a, had a focus on, on social capital. Um, uh, social capital and a sense of belonging is a fascinating way to get a feeling for the cohesive strength of a community. Um, years ago, when I was at the, the Dixie Bloor Neighborhood Center, um, uh, our, our board chair, John Lawton at the time, invented a terrific term, uh, it, uh, and I, I'm happy to attribute it to him, neighborhoodliness. Um, uh, grammatically incorrect, I'm sure, in several ways, but it really helped you get your arms around the idea that, that you, you um, need to be able to feel comfortable enough to, to, is, there, is there someone that you could go to next door or across the street or across the hall uh, to borrow a cup of sugar from? Um, is there a, a comfort uh, with, with, with your children um, uh, playing uh, outside uh, and, and uh, hope that the, the neighbors are also sort of keeping an eye on things uh, during, during uh, uh, playtime when, when, when uh, kids get a chance to, to blow up some steam? Um, that comfort, uh, it, it, I'm very happy to say, is high in, in, uh, in, in Mississauga. That, that, is, that is not an easy thing to build, that, that, that neighborhoodliness, that connectivity. Um, Professor Robert Put Putnam uh, popularized the phrase uh, uh, in his book, Bowling Al Alone uh, of Social Capital. And, and that was work, <laughs> academic work I did uh, in my, uh, with, uh, with uh, a degree 20 or so years ago. Um, his own work and my experience over 30 years leads to the fact that communities are best reached by people from that community. Um, there's an extra tie-in uh, to, to, to one another, uh, and those ties uh, are the ties that bind. Um, and that's why uh, dur during the pandemic, uh, six agencies across Peel worked with Dr. Lowe's amazing team at, at, at Peel Public Health and developed a high-priority community strategy. This meant that uh, uh, staff from, from Indus Community Services and the five other agencies had, had teams of community health ambassadors fanning out across parts of Mississauga and Brampton and, and uh, were, were used to help um, alleviate difficulties uh, uh, that COVID were creating. The study found that social capital is, is, is somewhat high across the region, but it also found that it divides a little bit around financial lines. 
the authors note that higher income inequality is associated with lower social capital. So the, the, the larger the difference in, in income in a given neighborhood, the, the less connected that, that group feels to each other. So it, it, it's, it's better to have more, if you will, more mixed neighborhoods and more connectivity amongst and, and between people. And that's a lot of what the Community Foundation aims to do is, is, is be a city builder and connecting groups to each other. Um, the, the Peel's high social uh, capital ca can and will contribute to the region's pandemic recovery efforts. Um, these efforts must address the recent increases in inequality. Uh, otherwise, we, we'll start seeing our social capital gains at risk. Um, this also speaks to locking in the progress made uh, by many community groups on, on, on anti-Black racism and systemic discrimination. Many of our institutions uh, in, in Mississauga, institutions, organizations, and, and leaders uh, uh, have helped to recognize that there is a, a difficulty uh, and a shortfall in, in how some of our institutions and organizations, almost all actually, treat uh, our, our, our Black and other diverse communities. Um, and so the, the, the fact that there are so many of these leaders at the tables, uh, uh, working alongside the Ontario Human Rights Commission, uh, working on the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan, working on the Anti-Black Racism and Systemic Dis uh, Discrimination Table, all that work uh, means that on the whole, Mississauga has a lot to be proud of, but there will be much more work to be done. Thank you, Gurpreet. I like that term, neighborhoodliness. Just uh, I need to practice it so it rolls off the tongue a little bit more smoothly. Um, so I'm very pleased to say thank you for taking two questions back to back there. But I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Lowe um, in, into the conversation. And uh, Dr. Lowe, uh, I have my next question for you, if, if I may. Um, as, um, as we've been discussing, Peel Region was hit particularly hard by the pandemic with some of the highest confirmed uh, cases um, and longer and more restrictive lockdowns to try and limit the spread of the disease. Do you see Peel Region requiring any further widespread lockdowns in the future, given the declining level of new cases and the current vaccination rate? And, and when will it be safe to relax restrictions entirely? Yeah, first of all, uh, let me just say it's uh, it's an honour to be here uh, with you all uh, today and certainly to be able to speak uh, side by side with uh, Gurpreet Mahultra, who we've worked with very closely uh, throughout the course of this pandemic. Uh, you know, and it's so important uh, just really to uh, highlight, I think the pandemic has upended so many uh, things about our day-to-day -day life, but at the same time, it has taught us so many uh, valuable lessons, I think, uh, both around uh, our, our own approach uh, uh, to, uh, to living well and also, I think, uh, our approach as a community to taking care of one another. Um, I don't believe that we'll be seeing any any further wide-scale lockdowns and I think a lot of that is a, a thanks and testament to uh, the willingness of our community to trust the science uh, and to look out for each other by stepping up and getting vaccinated in record numbers. So 89% uh, with one dose, 84% with two doses, really closing in on that 90% eligible 12 plus two dose coverage uh, has really changed the script. And I can I think you can see night and day the difference where uh, we had an unvaccinated uh, a susceptible population uh, last fall uh, versus this fall. Uh, the previous measures had to really be about trying to reduce contact and reducing uh, transmission from person to person. And I often say this, uh, you know, the emergencies play out uh, on the ground in which they land. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, an earthquake in a major urban centre is uh, very different from an earthquake in a desolate Arctic tundra. Um, and in the same way, a disease that spreads from person to person uh, will find uh, more significant opportunities to do so uh, in a populous, in a densely populated urban area, as opposed to maybe other parts of uh, other parts of, um, you know, a jurisdiction that are more rural or remote. Um, that said, uh, you know, it also in playing out on the ground that it played out on, we know that Peel has been, uh, you know, beset by inequities. Many of the disparities and inequities that we've seen in, the tra in, in transmission have reflected what we in public health and together with community agencies like Gurpreet, uh, uh, Gurpreet and Indus uh, and all of our community agencies that have been working with us on the high priority community strategy that was already mentioned, uh, have been talking about for, you know, for 
decades. Uh, really, just the challenges in Peel uh, with um, you know socioeconomic uh, and ethnocultural diversity that then render different people vulnerable uh, to all manners of health conditions. Um, and I often am very fond of just saying uh, it, it took a, a pandemic that spreads from person to person, a disease that spreads from person to person, to remind us that as a community we're all ultimately connected. Uh, and that was what necessitated obviously the previous large closures and whatnot in the past to just make sure we were breaking those chains of transmission and why I think hopefully uh, as we continue to take care of each other with the vaccines, uh, with the indoor masking, and of course uh, the big one is staying home if you're sick, which is frankly I think what we all should have done and back in the day we were all those big soldiers who were out there saying yeah we're gonna tough through it and presenteeism and all the other stuff. I think if you're sick, stay home this respiratory uh, respiratory season. Uh, I think people will be glad you did. Um, but uh, hopefully, with those three measures in place, and of course, uh, uh, continued um, uh, continued looking out for each other, uh, we will be able to weather the fall and winter in a much different way than we did previously. Thanks so much. And and I'm going to be a little bit cheeky and ask you a follow on question to that, which I, which I will um, you know feel free to say no to it. It's it's off script. Um, so one of the things I've been thinking about is that the pandemic has really shone a light on the importance of public health. And I think that we, we haven't really paid as much attention here in Canada, at least, to public health. You know, it's the, the things that public health deals with are, are not at necessarily as present in our country as they might be in other parts of the world. Um, and, and so we've taken it for granted. But what do you think or how do you think that the pandemic will really influence um, or change care prevention in the public health space moving forward, like coming out of this experience? I'm, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. For sure, Helen. And I would actually uh, maybe recharacterize it as uh, public health focuses on different health issues here as opposed to in other parts of the world. Uh, and really, I think it's it's an opportunity to uh, to shine a spotlight on the valuable work that we do uh, and really the intrinsic difference between the uh, goals of public health and the goals of the health care system, which we often get conflated with. Uh, the reality is that health is actually not about what happens in the walls of hospitals or in the walls of community clinics. Often uh, health is actually determined. It is something that is intrinsically given to us uh, at birth uh, and, uh, you know, and that we maintain and work on through our lives but it ultimately is shaped by your living conditions and your context. It is about uh, your education level. It's about all those determinants, the education level, income level, your housing, all those other pieces. And that has been the arena of public health uh, for so long. The, uh, and really uh, the other important work is uh, in collaboration and in partnership with the community, so with community agencies, with decision makers, with planning departments, whatever the case might be. So um, whether it is trying to create the community conditions uh, for good health uh, as it pertains to things like, um, you know, diabetes or cardiovascular disease or cancer, or other chronic diseases uh, in the long term or in an acute emergency, such as in a pandemic or uh, or other sort of infectious disease crisis or health, environmental health crisis, uh, the work of public health is often silent in success um, and oftentimes is, uh, is more considered and, uh, and uh, involving uh, a lot of input and engagement with the community. Uh, but of course, in an emergency, we come, it, it comes because our mandate stays the same. How do you create the conditions to keep people uh, safe and well? That's where we do have to emerge from the shadows and actually, you know, speak to uh, you know emergency measures that need to be taken and need to be need to be addressed so i think uh, the opportunity to again uh, highlight the uh, the essential work of public health as being in the community as being outside of the walls of hospital of really trying to create conditions where everyone can actually live their healthiest lives uh, and you know our vital work uh, how that intersects with all of our different partners uh, i think that is really the big opportunity that we now have uh, now that there's a greater understanding and focus on what we do as public health uh, as public health departments great thank you thank you for uh, for answering that question of mine i, I appreciate it hopefully others found the answer really interesting um Gurpreet, I'm going to come back to you with another question. Um, and, you know, please, at any time, if either one of you want to build on, on what you've said, just, just please interrupt me and go ahead. Um, but I'd, I'd like to sort of shift uh, to immigration. And this is sort of another area that we address in Vital Signs. Um, immigrants make up a very important portion of, of Mississauga's population. And I wonder, Gurpreet, are there any trends that you'd like to highlight from the Vital Signs report related to this area? Well, well, here's here's one. I, I'll start off with by wishing you and Dr. Lowe and everyone uh, who's here today happy Diwali. 
um, a, a, a holiday celebrated by Hindus and Sikhs and others around the world that celebrate um, uh, the victory of light over darkness. Um, and, and the fact that you, I'd almost say almost everyone here would recognize the greeting is a sign of how immigration has helped all of us to evolve to a better understanding uh, of, of uh, uh, newer communities uh, here in, in, uh, in Mississauga. Um, something I particularly like about the Community Foundation's Vital Signs Report is that its authors comb reputable local sources of good data and, and research. And they use this to paint a complete picture for all of us to examine. Uh, in 2019, the Peel Newcomer Strategy Group found that between 94 and 2014, increasing numbers of immigrants were leaving the region, suggesting that immigrants likely make up a large portion of the out-migration. Now, while there are different definitions of the, the term immigrant, um, this is a very concerning trend if it continues to be a pattern uh, and is worth exploring. Some of the push factors the reasons, if you will, that someone, uh, a newcomer might leave the region um, include the cost of housing. We, 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 those of us who are lucky enough to be homeowners have seen the value of our homes skyrocket. Uh, but those of us who are concerned also about the young people in our lives or, or new, those who are newly arrived in Mississauga, uh, the, 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 how would they breach that affordability? So, so that's a major push factor to, to, to uh, have people move out. Um, uh, employment opportunities uh, and general affordability. The, the, these uh, 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 encourage, if you will, people to, to leave or discourage people to help stay and build up our community. The other community may have a pull factor, less congestion, uh, cheaper housing uh, and, and access perhaps to cultural supports. Canadians have long known that immigration is a vital economic engine. We, 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 we get it. And, and, and it's a nation built um, uh, on, on Indigenous land, uh, settled and, 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 and built and, and, and strengthened by, by its newcomers. Um, but this engine, um, it needs tending. Uh, we see uh, parts of it are, are, are broken. An example is the international student stream that supports immigration. Um, the, their costs of housing, their costs of tuition, uh, the difficulties they face in, 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 in uh, finding sustainable uh, work uh, and, and being treated fairly by both landlord and employer, um, this imperils that group. And the fact that they have a lack of access to existing supports makes it even harder for them. So that community as well as other new communities are, are particularly vulnerable. And, and we as, as, as people who see the benefit of, of, of newcomers uh, and the strengths that they bring to, to um, building our city in, 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 a, in a stronger and more vibrant fashion, that we have to understand that we need more supports. Otherwise we, we will experience a huge loss uh, both to the individual who suffers through through uh, the difficulty, but uh, uh, ultimately to our city, community, and society, um, where where we definitely need to understand that that supporting the vulnerable is the best way to to build a, a, a better place to live for all. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, I've always been struck by some of the statistics that came out of the 2018 Vital Signs Report just on the, si the, the, the size and shape of our population um, here in Mississauga. And of course, that was 2018 was built on newly released census data. So it gave us like a really current snapshot. And it will be interesting to see in the next census in a couple of years, like what what has changed and, and or how much that's grown even. Um, so uh, my next question, I'm going to pivot back to Dr. Lowe, um, and I, I, we're, you know, mental health has been a significant issue for, for many people throughout the pandemic, um, not only social isolation, um, just the, the worry of, over the pandemic, worry over employment issues, they've all contributed to challenges um, in a person's overall mental well-being. I wonder what comments you have about this and, and what, what people could do to combat this negative effect of the pandemic and begin to recover. 
Yeah, well, thank you very much. And uh, I, in responding first, I will uh, say that uh, happy Diwali, happy Bundy Chor Divas to everyone as well. Uh, and and to you, uh, and to Gurpreet's point, uh, and to, and the question, um, that, you know, really combating a lot of the of the mental uh, health and wellness challenges that the pandemic has presented is about really re-establishing those relationships. And so I certainly am glad to hear that our, our South Asian communities will hopefully uh, make the uh, make the opportunity to do so uh, over this holiday and also to uh, to celebrate safely, of course, uh, but to but to make sure that they're re-establishing those connections because it is it is really vital, I think, first and foremost, uh, for us. To, and by the way, Helen, I'm, I'm really uh, glad at the way you phrased the question because it really is the pandemic that has been the root cause uh, to most of the mental health, uh, wellness and uh, and uh, challenges that we've faced. Uh, and I think all of us, if we even just take a deep breath and a moment to realize we've lived through an unprecedented human health crisis. We've lived through uh, a century pandemic with a with a beast of a disease, frankly, uh, that um, that uh, it, I, I was just uh, actually the motion that I was speaking to uh, was around pandemic preparedness today. And uh, the question was, well, did we have plans? Well, yes, we had plans, but it's like when a category five or higher hurricane shows up, you know, the best plans uh, are not going to be able to fully encapsulate or uh, or anticipate uh, all of the different twists and turns that a disaster of this magnitude is going to inflict upon your community. Um, and to, the, to many people, I, I believe there's also a, a general misattribution uh, amongst certain quarters in the community that they say, oh, well, it was the measures. It was the it was the isolation. It was the needing to stay home uh, that resulted in mental health. And I feel like nothing could be further from the truth, because if you actually look at countries that didn't, uh, you know, institute control measures and saw huge surges of COVID-19, they had the exact same mental health challenges and and then some, uh, you know, uh, families who had lost loved ones, children growing up without parents like these are going to have huge uh, mental health impacts uh, in countries, uh, in, in certain countries where the disease spread out of control. So the, it, it, the root cause was the pandemic, regardless of whether we instituted measures or didn't institute measures, there was going to be massive perturbation of mental health uh, issues uh, in, our, in our various countries. Um, and really, that's the first step to recovery is to reflect on it and just realize that we've lived through something uh, extraordinary, extraordinarily difficult. We've lived through um, a time that, uh, you know, I think it, by comparison in modern history, it's probably just the Spanish flu in, in 1918, 1919 uh, would have any any sort of comparison. And it's worth noting, especially people often, uh, you know, the, the one thing we think about is everyone who's lost loved ones. Um, uh, during this pandemic as well, people will point to the to the uh, death toll worldwide and say, well, it wasn't as bad as the Spanish flu. COVID-19 has taken 5 million lives worldwide, and that's with many countries implementing measures. So you can imagine what would happen uh, if we had basically let this kind of let this kind of go in the way that the Spanish flu did. I think that the numbers would have likely been very similar. So the first step is to, to really look at, you know, realizing and recognizing. Then the second step is to actually give people time and space. I think uh, as we're emerging out into into um, this, uh, you know, post pandemic reality, not everyone's going to want to come back the same way uh, in the same time. I think people have learned different lessons and different ways of living, different ways of engaging. They've learned to value things differently. Um, and they've also learned, uh, you know, just uh, with uh, with certain approaches that, you know, some people are just more comfortable with uh, are less comfortable with letting go of certain precautions, etc. So let people come back at the same time, gradual returns to work, gradual returns to socializing, you know, attuned to how people feel. Um, and then that said, as it, as you sort of you know take the time to reflect, as you take the time to give give yourself and your your networks and your loved ones the space uh, to um, to recover at your own pace, uh, there is still a need though to to reach out, gently reach out, especially to those who may have been rendered vulnerable if they live alone, if they've had other challenges with mobility or whatever the the case might be throughout the pandemic, if they've lost a loved one. Uh, to do to 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 actually do check in gently with uh, with individuals who may and just being being available and being there. So um, it is about reestablishing relationships, reestablishing routines, uh, and reflecting. I think in uh, in really trying to recapture our mental health uh, after this unprecedented crisis. Thank you. That's the really kind of thought thought provoking answer and uh, I think that every one of us on the call can can relate to what you have said there and um, it is very important to note that it is the pandemic and not other and not other issues so thank thank you for kind of really hitting that home for me at least 
Um, I, we have one more question that I wanted to put to you, and I'd like to actually put it to, to both of you. And that is, you know, as you've just described, Dr. Lowe, the, the, the pandemic has taken a significant toll like locally here in Mississauga, nationally across Canada and globally. And we've really struggled to address all of the challenges that it's produced. But, but what have we learned from it? So I would really love to hear your perspectives and perhaps I'll go to you first, Gurpreet, but you know, what have we learned from this experience speaking from your frame of reference? Um, and how can what we've learned, how can we use that to prepare for, for something in the future that may come? I think what we've learned is that, that we need each other. I, I think that we've, we've really come to grips that we need the co-worker at the next desk. Um, we, we, we need um, the community service sector that's in some cases is, is, is the only smile received by, by an isolated senior or, or, or um, um, a, a, a child uh, it, it, that may be in some form of distress. It, it, we are people people and we like being around each other now I, I, I you know not everyone not all the time and there's there, there's the strength in, in, in being able to to, to enjoy one's uh, solitude but the fact that we're people people that we wish to be near each other we wish to uh, be in a movie theater or, or join friends for dinner uh, be in each other's homes uh, uh, that for me is, is, is a really big positive because sometimes in the busyness of, of our everyday life we, we pre the pandemic we we're just rushing from one thing to the other and and what I've noticed more and more on zoom calls and other things is a is, is a warming up a sense of of uh, gosh I miss you I, I, I miss being able to, to, to talk to you uh, uh, compare stories of, of, of the kids in Halloween uh, bring in some banana bread you know whatever it is uh, and that missing of each other, uh, what I'm so pleased about is that people I think now will value their parks and value their friendships and value their their, their, their community. And, and, and that is a silver lining to the cloud is that we get what it really means to, to have a happy, happy little ones uh, ring the doorbell uh, uh, and, 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 and wish you a happy Halloween. That, that's that was wonderful uh, and I'm really hoping that together we will never forget uh, how much we really mean to each other and I think that's that's one of the best strengths of Mississauga. Thank you. Dr. Lowe, do you want to follow that? Yeah, yeah I mean I'll, I'll talk, uh, it's it's hard to follow that, it's always hard to follow Gurpreet, um, but, <laughs> but I'm uh, I'm happy to uh, share I think a professional learning and, and, and a personal learning and I think one of the things that uh, was was really striking for me uh, throughout the pandemic um, is uh, is all of our pandemic, we, we had pandemic influenza plans in place, we had all sorts of things, we were ready to go for pandemic purposes. Um, in terms of one of the things that will be heavily contested and debated in the future was that would be the role of border closures and travel restrictions. Um, I think as many of you will remember in the early phase of the pandemic, uh, it was actually said that these are not going to prevent uh, the spread of the disease. Um, and we, you know, I, I think that's actually been borne out. It's either you have to basically just at the right moment uh, trigger some sort of massive border closure uh, to basically uh, create your fortress, which is why uh, island countries such as Australia and New Zealand were able to um, forestall the inevitable for as long as they did. But in the end, as you can see, that you, you can only forestall the inevitable for so long, and then they ultimately, uh, you know, ultimately we actually probably through our through the course of our response, we're closer to the exit than they are, um, just uh, just given where where things had gone. But what, what is interesting to me is that the data is very clear uh, that even with airlines suspending flights to China in the initial phases, uh, you know, selective targeted travel restrictions didn't work um, because rea the reality is that the Delta variant still got here, uh, despite the fact that they banned flights from India, which I know was a huge hardship for our community and for many in our community. Um, and the virus still got here, ultimately not from China or Western Europe, but it was actually the United States and the challenge response and our deep integration. And I often love to quote this statistic for everyone who's like, well, Canada could have just done what New Zealand did. 
New Zealand pre-pandemic got as many travelers internationally uh, into their country as can as cross the Canadian U.S. border every day. So, I mean, if you're thinking about a sheer like a, a, the sheer challenge that's within us and leaving aside the fact that five million people live in New Zealand, which is less than the entire greater Toronto area. Um, you know, I think we, we were dealt a very different hand here uh, in, in Canada, and I think the role of border closures and whether that even is something we would have been able to contemplate. Because I think by the time we realized it was coming uh, from the uh, from the challenge response in the US, uh, it was already too late uh, to, the, the cat was already largely out of the bag. So that's the professional learning. I think the personal learning I have is similar along Capri's, uh, you know, just the fact that we need each other, but the value of time. And I, you know, I, being somewhat younger and earlier in my career, um, I'd always, uh, I, I don't know that I'd always been uh, as, um, as you know, clear about the both the quantity and quality of time that I'd be spending on certain things. Um, no longer, I, I think, uh, especially when you're in in, in this uh, leadership role that I've been in. Uh, you know, time time away from my girls, time just listening to music because my my days are just filled with meetings now. I I, I realized so. Uh, there there are certain things that just disappeared, and I realized that I really didn't have time for. Um, and that actually will, I imagine, uh, you know, start to inspire. I hope a lot of other people that with the time we do have uh, to make the most of it, um, and especially for our children, who, by the way, I think uh, like just with my own two daughters, I realize are resilient beyond measure, just with everything that they've uh, they've endured and the challenges that they've faced. And by the way, for many people, I know that there's a lot of people that they're concerned saying, well, you know, these children, they may have long lasting issues. They may have uh, challenges with development and, and mental health in the future. And that may be true. But it is also worth noting that in a Western context, uh, you know, the children that lived through the Spanish flu uh, were ultimately those that became part of the greatest generation. And, uh, and defeated fascism 20 years later, right? So um, I, I think the kids are all right. Uh, they're gonna be all right, they're resilient. Um, and my personal learning is that I've resolved to spend as much time as I can with them and my family and friends in the manner that Gurpreet's identified, uh, making the most of, I think, the very short time that we all have together, uh, you know, uh, here, on, here, here in this community. Thank you. Helen, if I, if I, can I please add a little piece? Yeah, of course. I, I, I'd like to publicly thank Dr. Lowe uh, for, 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 for your leadership. Um, you've been able to galvanize a community behind you. Um, I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but you've been able to stand up to other levels of government and, and, and do the right things to protect us. And, and, and um, that, those moments have been some of my proudest um, uh, and thank you for your leadership and thank you for your team, uh, public health, for, for, for the enormous personal sacrifices they've made to, to help keep us as healthy as possible. So, so th thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gurpreet. And if I could just quickly respond to everyone, uh, you know, honestly, I, I have been incredibly well supported, um, you know, an excellent leadership team. And, but of course, as and I've mentioned numerous times uh, through this presentation, we couldn't have done it without our partnerships with our community agencies, our healthcare partners, et cetera. Um, and I will tell you this whole community, our regional council, everyone has really stood by us and, uh, and, and came together. And I saw this, uh, you know, when I worked as a family doctor, uh, I, it wasn't in Mississauga, it was, I, it was up in Brampton, but still, uh, I know the, the communities are intricately linked, but I started out as a family doc in Peel and I saw the resilience of the Peel community firsthand. Uh, and it's been an honor and privilege to serve, uh, especially knowing I've been well, so well supported. So thank you so much for that. Thank you both. I think this has been a really, really great discussion. And um, what we were, what we we'd like to do now, I, I think, and also just to to build on the comments, I think that the many of the the people and organizations watching this webinar today are from the charities and nonprofits that serve Mississauga and the community and are filling the gaps in care and and programming that have been really needed during this pandemic. So I think that they are. I, I can see in the chat. There's a lot of big thank yous and hand claps. So um, just recognizing who is also listening to this and 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 ultimately who we've produced the vital signs for, which is like how to, to demonstrate where the need is to help funders make smart decisions. So without giving too much away, I, I, I'd like to thank Gurpreet and Dr. Lowe for participating. And um, at this point, we would also like to thank all of those who have been involved in the production of this year's Vital Signs. So Pauline, I'm not sure if you want to put the, the slide back up. Um, 
But there, um, there was a, a group um, from the board of directors who supported, um, but also uh, we'd like to thank our vital signs advisory team, um, which I think is on the next on the next slide. Um, we had our research and writing done by a fantastic agency called Social Impact Squared with Paul Baker and Stephen Ayer. Um, and thank you also to our graphic design team at Loop. Um, and of course, the staff at the Community Foundation without whom this would not be possible. So Lorraine, Pauline and James, um, who is our, our fabulous associate from an RBC career launch program that we're involved with. Great program out of RBC as well. Um, we'd also like to thank our partners in action. There are a number of organizations, uh, local companies across Mississauga that support the work that we do here at, here at the Community Foundation. Um, their logos are, are on the slide that you can all see, but um, the, without their support, it's really difficult for us to do the work that we do in the community as all of um, those other charities and nonprofits on the line would, uh, would recognize. So at this point, I'd like to pass um, things over to the chair of our board, Erica. Um, Erica, if you're able to turn your, here we go. So I'm going to hand things over okay. to you to say a few words and to uh, introduce someone new to the foundation. Okay. Uh, thank you, Helen. I too would like to thank Dr. Lone Gurpreet Malotra for your precious time and insight into the 2021 Vital Signs Report and Helen for moderating today's launch. The Community Foundation of Mississauga is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year, and due to the pandemic, the board made the decision to postpone our celebrations to the spring of 2022. We felt the Summer Olympics could be delayed for a year. The foundation could afford the same privilege. We will notify all of you once the date is confirmed. It is now my pleasure to introduce our incoming president and CEO. Born and raised in Mississauga, he is passionate about supporting the growth and development of a vibrant community. He brings over 25 years of experience in corporate and nonprofit sector experience, making him the ideal candidate to carry the Community Foundation into the future. Please join me in welcoming Glenn Gamolka. Good morning, uh, everyone, and thank you, Erica, and the entire board of directors, as well as all the staff at the Community Foundation for such a warm welcome. I feel like I'm already a uh, part of the team already, so thank you for that. Um, my first official day is actually on Monday, um, but I really wanted to be part of this session this morning, and I think um, our speakers were fantastic. The Vital Signs Report, if you haven't looked at it or downloaded it already, is, uh, is a great report and it really provides a wonderful foundation for me in understanding the challenges and issues that are facing our community. And of course, the board of directors has challenged me to um, take the foundation forward and increase our impact in the community. And I think that these types of conversations are exactly what we need to do to move the foundation forward and to increase our impact over time. Um, so now that we all have this wonderful information, this great data that clearly outlines the challenges that we have to address in our community, I think it's up to all of us, the foundation, the community groups that are participating today, as well as residents and policymakers, volunteers and donors, each of us collectively have to work together to continue these conversations and continue them until we find that they have meaningful and impactful uh, results that combat the issues that have been outlined in the Vital Signs Report. And of course, ultimately, we wanna see an improved quality of life in the city of Mississauga for all the residents as we come out of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so to that end, over the coming weeks and months, I plan on reaching out and engaging with as many community groups and stakeholders as I possibly can. And I wanna work with you collectively to explore solutions to the issues that we've outlined today. Um, currently, um, my information uh, is not available on the Community Foundation website, but it should be in the next couple of days. Um, so if people on the line today want to connect with me, please do so through LinkedIn. And over the next couple of days when my, um, my, my coordinates are live, I encourage you all to reach out to me by email or by phone. Um, and I want to hear from you. I want to know what your feedback is, your suggestions and ideas for how we can build a community together. Um, I'm not going to take up too much more of your time, but I did want to say um, I'm deeply honored and um, I look forward to working with the Community Foundation. I look forward to serving my community and serving the Community Foundation. I'm really keen to roll up my sleeves and get to work. And so I'm really looking forward to working with everybody. 
Um, and at this point, I just want to again say thank you for including me this morning, and I'm going to turn the mic back over to Helen. Thank you so much, Glenn. We are really excited to have you on board and we look forward to your vision for the foundation to growing um, our, and growing our impact and all that we can do. So we have just touched the surface of our vital signs research and the report and I really hope uh, and encourage each of you here today to download the full report from our website. Um, which covers uh, topics, all the indicators that you can see on the slide in front of you. Also, you could look for a summary of our vital signs report in the Mississauga News. If it's not delivered to your home or your residence, I know that they, they will often have it at Shoppers Drug Mart or some of the other local community um, businesses. So you might want to take a look for it there. The summary is, is really great, just a four pager that opens up. Um, in the past, we know that lots of you have used this to as a resource to inform uh, your grant applications. And I promise you that in the future, when we open our application cycle, we once again will be asking you to consider how your project relates back to the vital signs um, and vital areas of need that are in Mississauga. So, so please use this as a resource. Um, and for those of you on the, on the line who are donors, there are areas of need that are really well outlined in this report. So use it to guide your giving and consider uh, providing your support in the form of donations to areas that are outlined in our vital signs report. And of course, anyone at the foundation is always willing to have a conversation with you about your giving. So that's the end of our um, of our event today. Um, we'd like to thank you for your time. We're ending a little bit early, but um, I hope that you found the conversation stimulating. And on behalf of everyone at the foundation and everyone who worked on this vital signs report, um, I'd just like to say a really big thank you. And I'm looking forward to the conversations that we're going to have around this data in the, the weeks, months, and years to come. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day, everybody.